All right, so uh, my name is Zachary Bain. Um, I've been with Exito for uh, a year plus some, if you count the sorry, summer orientation now. Um, and since uh, November, I've been working up at OHSU, um, participating in a research field there. Um, I've been working with Anna Wilson's lab, who I believe you saw on a panel yesterday. Um, we do a lot of uh, adolescent uh, pain um, research. Uh, and yeah, let's see. So uh, my research so far has focused on the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, basically, that is um, any of the uh, infants born prematurely or any infants that are born with um, serious medical conditions uh, will go into this intensive care unit to be taken care of. Um, so what we did was we took a look at all the visitation logs um, and tried to find patterns in the data so that we could better use that to um, kind of gauge who was visiting, when they were visiting, why they were visiting, um, as well as a lot of demographic information so that we could try and increase that visitation. Um, so with that, we did a lot of data entry, um, a lot of data analysis, um, and I ended up making a poster out of it, uh, which I presented at OHSU's uh, research week um, in May. Uh, so in addition to that, we've also worked on a variety of other projects. Um, a lot of the labs you'll go into won't just be working on one thing at a time. They'll be working on multiple different studies and papers. Um, and you may be asked to help with all of them or you know, a lot of them. Uh, so some of the other things I've done um, have included uh, literature reviews. Um, we've done protocol testing, which is essentially making sure that the uh, study you're doing works correctly, um, making sure the surveys are working and emails are getting sent correctly, um, things like that. Um, so the support available uh, in these uh, research, research groups, these research learning communities that you'll be joining um, is very uh, intensive. So there's a lot of support available to you from a lot of different resources. Um, I'd say the biggest source of support has definitely been my mentor, Anna Wilson. Um, she's been huge. Uh, we have check-ins regularly to make sure that um, I'm working and that I'm enjoying the work I'm doing and that I feel like my time is being used correctly. Um, we talk about future projects. We talk about um, you know, any issues that I'm having, because when I first came in, I didn't know how to do lit reviews. I didn't know how to do data entry. Um, and she really helped me get started on that. Um, the RA, Catlin Dennis, um, is a huge help. She works under Anna Wilson, and she kind of runs everything in the lab. Um, she does all the scheduling. She does all the nitty gritty, making sure that um, volunteers are scheduled at the right times, making sure that we uh, don't have any questions, making sure that any resource we need gets taken care of. Um, she does a lot of the back and forth from us to OHSU because there's a lot of approval that you need, a lot of training courses you'll have to take, and she makes sure that all of that flows smoothly. Um, the other source of support that I didn't realize I would have going in is the other researchers there. So a lot of them are also volunteers or are grad students, and they've been right where you're at now, starting out, and they are massive sources of support. Um, they are just fountains of knowledge that uh, is free. <laughs> um, so everything from uh, their opinions on how to do a particular task to uh, how they schedule and organize themselves, they are a huge resource, and I urge you to uh, take advantage of that. So there are expectations um, involved when you're in a professional setting. Um, looking around the room, I can see that most of you know that. You're dressed professionally. You know, you're not speaking out of turn, things like that. Um, so having a professional attire and attitude is very important. You want to make sure, especially at uh, my lab where we have patient interaction, you want to make sure that you look nice. You know, you should always have your OHSU badge. You should always be wearing things that are um, if not super business formal, at least business casual, um, making sure that you know you look presentable. 
Um, you also need to have a strong work ethic because a lot of this you'll be doing on your own. You know, you won't have someone over your shoulder the whole time. Um, and you need to make sure that you're communicating effectively with your team. Because if you don't have communication, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, so here are some tips and tricks. Make sure you have a good schedule, stay focused and ask for help when you need it. Everyone's been there and everyone needs help once in a while. Um, and if you don't understand a task or if you feel inexperienced in something, that's completely normal and everyone goes through it and your research mentors are there to help you. My name is Kim Dolan. Um, I'm about to start my, what will be the first of two senior years as a biochemistry major uh, in the RICAL lab over here. And um, it's a quick overview of the research that we do in this lab. Um, they focus on sort of the structural characterization of proteins, specifically uh, water channels that regulate water flow uh, across cell membranes. and. Uh, in particular, this protein here called aquaporin zero. Uh, it's found in the uh, mammalian eye lens and it's responsible for regulating water and allows for uh, lens transparency. So uh, misregulation of this protein results in a clouding of the eye lens, which is cataracts. Um, so previous work in this lab has developed this structural model, which has uh, the top part is the aquaporin zero and the bottom two uh, proteins there are uh, this other protein called calmodulin, which is responsible for regulating the, uh, the water flow. Um, what we're working on right now, my project, is figuring out how exactly it regulates water flow. The mechanism for this is currently unknown. Um, so they study this, uh, this interaction through a variety of methods. Uh, biochemistry and biophysics, and then um, also using this imaging technique called uh, cryo-EM, which, um, which allows, to, allows imaging of, uh, of proteins in their, in their native state, and you can do single particle analysis um, and see how uh, a protein like moves dynamically. Uh, so, a lot of the stuff that Zach covered, I think, is true in my lab and my experience as well. But um, as far as support that's provided for me as a researcher in the RICAL lab, um, we have weekly meetings where we go over, you know, what I've been doing. We discuss my results um, and, you know, give me advice on how to proceed. Um, I also work very closely with a grad student in the lab, um, and he is. Uh, He's really the primary person that I that I work with, and he's you know he'll show me how to do everything that uh, we we work on. He explains everything in great detail, um, and uh, so he would be my primary research mentor. Um, and then as far as expectations, uh, and I'm also going to mimic a lot of what Zach said, but uh, you know being punctual, accountable, um, having good research integrity. So if you mess something up, you know you're they want to know about it and it's fine. You're not expected to, you know, show up and have like perfect research capabilities. You're, you're an undergrad and they, they understand that. Um, so, uh, and definitely always ask for help if you need it. Um, everybody there has advice and answers and, you know, maybe, maybe they'll have the same question and that's something else that you can talk to your PI about. Um, and then as far as tips for a successful undergraduate experience, uh, like questions, questions. So you, uh, you might have interest in something else that's going on in the lab that's not directly related to your project, and um, that's an opportunity to learn something else. Like uh, if you have extra time, there's always things to be done, and that's just going to expand your, uh, your expertise and make you more comfortable in that work environment. Um, and then definitely take great notes all the time. So uh, not just because that's uh, good lab habits, uh, but your future self will thank you when you're looking back and trying to understand what you did, especially early on when you don't necessarily uh, fully comprehend how the thing that you're doing relates to the bigger picture of your project as you're sort of getting into it. Um, when you look back, you can you can have more clarity and, uh, and it'll be very helpful and you'll be glad that you did that. And then uh, when I say make your own opportunities, there, uh, there are going to be 
things like what he talked about his poster presentation, um, maybe there's conferences, like if you're really interested in the research that's being done in your lab, um, everybody's very busy and you might encounter something where like, oh, I'd like to present uh, at this poster presentation, put that in front of your PI, things like that. Um, or as I said before, talking to other graduate students in, their, in your lab and taking the opportunity to maybe learn something about their project. Um, yeah, and thank you. That's about it. So hello everyone, my name is Sean Tyler. Uh, I was in your guys' seats last year where we all were, so I hope uh, the orientation is going good. Um, so I'm Sean, I'm a student here at PSU, uh, studying pre-dental, and um, I've been working with Dr. Uh, Katie Zuckerman at uh, OHSU. Um, she works in the uh, Doran Becker uh, Children's Hospital and um, she uh, has a focus with uh, autism. So, um, so many of you guys will get placed into a lab that has a lot of ongoing research. So, uh, so like for the first two months when I was there, I kind of was just doing a bunch of random things. Like I didn't know their correlation to anything. I didn't know what exactly the, the focus was or anything. I just knew that they asked me to do something, so I was happy to, to do it. Um, but um, so Katie, yeah, she works with uh, pediatrics um, and uh, the focus on autism. So with autism, she has a lot of surveys, uh, a lot of questionnaires, uh, um, a lot of uh, screenings and things like that. So it's kind of a lot of uh, uh, just free responses that you kind of have to read and you got to have to gather the information. Um, and kind of place in these different categories. Uh, so I kind of was just doing so much stuff and then, you know, they would say, oh, great job, Sean, here's the next, uh, you know, pile of things to do. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I mean, it was great. It's, it's kind of interesting, like, uh, hearing, um, you know, parents' responses about autism and, and, and some of them have no idea and uh, they don't know what to do. Um, and it's kind of, uh, scary at times, so it's pretty important actually um, that, that she gathers this information and they kind of figure out the best way to, um, to help people. Um, but my research, I guess, like kind of the reason why I was placed with, with Katie uh, is because she was interested in a fluoride project. And um, uh, so, like, Oregon is like this huge fluoride thing and you know people don't want it in their water and um, and parents don't want uh, parents don't want to give their children fluoride they think you know something bad might happen uh, so we're kind of looking at um, that aspect of it and then we're also wanting to look at um, the role of non-dental providers uh, so like pediatricians and really anybody else besides your dentist um, who has the authority to prescribe fluoride and, and, and supplements, fluoride supplements. Um, so, and, and another thing about research, it's a lot of waiting too. So like, I mean, we've been working on this, this project since September and we're kind of just now getting started. Like we haven't gotten any of the data yet. So, and um, so it's a lot of waiting, but it's, it's the, the process is fun because you know, you're, you're, you're learning about it. Um, so support, um, uh, Exito is going to provide you guys with a lot of mentors. You know, I had like five different mentors, so they all support you in different ways. Um, but with Katie, because it, it's it's really not a lab; it's an office, and uh, me and her were just one on one, we're face to face all the time. So the support from her came from just asking me like how my day was, and like really. You know, she asked some follow-up questions and really showing that concern, like, Sean, are you okay? You look stressed out, you know? So uh, just that support from her really helped and really made me, uh, you know, want to go back. Um, so expectations. So, you know, they're going <laughs> to... They're gonna, they're gonna expect, they're gonna give you this pile of stuff that was in the end and then they're gonna expect you to get it done, you know, basically, so... Um, but, but while you're doing all the things, you know, they expect you to have fun, they expect you to, to be excited and, uh, 
and, and they're going to expect you to, to come in there, you know, ready to work and, and ready um, to ask questions and, and, um, and just be excited to be there. Uh, I got a, one more minute. Um, so if I had a, to, to give you guys some type of guidance or some tips, uh, I would just say to, um, you know, to appreciate this opportunity because it is a really great opportunity. Um, I probably wouldn't be doing research if it wasn't for Exito um, because I'm, I'm scared to talk to my professors, you know, because that's what I think it is. It's like you have to talk to the professor, you know, your, your chemistry professor and say, oh, well, you know, can I work in your lab and stuff. So, um, so without Exito, I probably wouldn't be doing research. So, uh, you know, really appreciate this opportunity. And, um, you know, the person that you're working with should see that you appreciate it. You know, that, you know when you go into their office, uh, they should say, wow, you know, this person really wants to be here. They really want to. Uh, learn. They really want to um, uh, help us out. Uh, so that's kind of all I got for you guys. I think it's valuable to note. Am I stay up here? You're, you're, you're right here. I'm just buying buying gin time here. Uh, I think it's valuable to note that. You know, a year ago, if we would have called these scholars out of the audience and said, you know, 365 days from now you're going to present, uh, there might have been some alarm. Uh, or there, if we had blood pressure cuffs on them, we could have seen a spike for sure. Uh, but it's valuable to note, uh, like a mentor of mine said, you know, using the image of headlights. Headlights in a vehicle, you only see maybe 20, 30 feet in front of you, but you can, you can drive the whole way that way. Uh, you don't have to see 3,000 miles away. My, my parents live in Philadelphia. I've made the trek back and forth by car many times. You don't have to see all the way across to Portland. You just have to see 20, 30 feet in front of you. I mean, uh, our scholars that are here today are phenomenal examples of seeing 20, 30 feet in front of them. A year later, here they are. So, Maya, welcome. Thank you. Hi, guys. So I am an Exito scholar. I was in the first cohort, and I was in the Dr. Fair's neuroimaging lab. And woo, go Marguerite. <laughs> um, okay, so my research was a lot of like pretty much just making really cool graphs, looking at really awesome pictures, and just kind of asking a lot of questions, trying to figure out what does this all even mean. So I think, um, like Zachary and a lot of other scholars in the program, I was able to present at OHSU's Research Week. And with that, I was able to come up with these really cool graphs. And basically what I was looking at was how parental education affects brain development in youth. Um, there's a lot of like sciencey jargon in there that I won't go into, but um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Poster was super good, and I think that one of the big takeaways with the research that I was doing was being able to kind of connect with other people. At the OHSU's poster presentation, I actually met someone who was willing to give me, like, he was basically like, send me a copy of your CV, which I haven't done, unfortunately, but it was a great opportunity, and um, yeah, I really appreciate that. So, support. I think that the biggest ways that I received support in the lab was just attending lab meetings. Um, a lot of the lab was not specifically working on things that related to my major, but instead it was more so of like a longitudinal project where everyone was kind of like keying in on people key aspects, and um, specifically, I spent a lot of time in the lab just doing data analysis, which means that I was looking at the brains and making sure that when people were getting MRIs that they were scanning correctly and that like all of like the parts of the brain were coming out how they were supposed to be coming out. And so I spent a lot of time doing that, but I think that being able to talk in lab meeting and get specific help on maybe like there's certain um, programs that we're using on the computers or just kind of like, hey, I'm really interested in doing this. Is there like a program that even does this? I think was something that was super helpful in my lab meetings. And that was kind of the one time where everyone from the lab was there. So if you ever needed to collaborate with someone else, that would be a good time. Um, another thing that would offer a lot of support was just being able to know that people are only an email away. Um, I think that like research gets like a common conception that like everyone is just like going to be like pipetting like little tiny things into things and like that was not how my lab is at, at all. It's more so like I had like a little cubicle and I made that cubicle like my like, 
it was there for me, ride or die. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so just being able to check my emails was super helpful. And then also, I think another way to offer support was just being able to ask people for help throughout the lab. Um, because we were so in such tight quarters with the cubicles, it wasn't hard just to walk in, over and ask someone, like, hey, like, I'm really struggling with this. Do you mind helping me out? So I think expectations that my PI, as well as others in the lab, had of me was just to be present. Um, being there and being ready to work was something that was really important because like a lot of this other my peers mentioned, there's not going to be someone there to kind of hold your hand the whole way. Like you kind of maybe like get dragged by your hand, but it's not so much as like a, yeah. So I think being able to just kind of be present and knowing when you need help is super helpful. And likewise, like you might get placed in a lab where you don't know a lot about anything. Like, for me, I knew nothing about neuroimaging or the brain, really, at all. So just um, being willing to kind of try, and again, going back to asking questions. And then I think the last expectation was just that I made sure I was really, like, holding up to doing what I said I was going to do. Um, with the project that we were working on, it was a longitudinal project, which means that there was a lot of little steps that kind of were going into a larger project. And with that, like, I spent a lot of time doing, like, data analysis and, like, I made sure that by the time I was going to leave that lab that I had completed what I said I was going to complete. So just kind of making like check lines for yourself so that everything can get done. Um, guidance. I was going to say that if you might get placed in a lab, obviously it's not Exito's like goal to place you in a lab that's not relatable to your major, but it happens and sometimes you just got to really make the best of it. And I think that the experience that I had in this lab really helped me to develop, develop kind of transferable skills as far as like, how do I talk to a PI? Who is a PI? What do I do with this? And um, just being able to kind of network. Um, a lot of people are going to be here to help you and you have so many mentors. So just making sure that you're really reaching out to them. And also, with the length of the project that was already going on in the lab, you just kind of have to be prepared to do busy work, maybe for a little bit until you can kind of figure out what you're doing. But they are super helpful if this is a field that you're maybe not um, familiar with. Um, they're super helpful with kind of giving you those skills that you would need to kind of move forward. And lastly, just make the most of it. Thank you. And the second year scholar who uh, gets the travel to f the furthest award for second year scholars. Ashley, welcome. All right, hi, I'm Ashley Widmer. I'm from the University of Alaska Anchorage, and I'm involved in cancer immunotherapy research uh, through the use of liposomal nanoparticles. And I'm under the guidance of Dr. Max Kohlberg. He's actually one of the faculty at the Whammy Medical School at uh, uh, UAA. So cancer immunotherapy is an elegant alternative to chemotherapy in the fact that this alternative is extremely important because with the use of chemotherapy, the chemicals not only affect the cancer cells, but also other rapidly dividing cell types, which leads to unwanted toxic side effects and further injury of patients. So we're looking at reactivating the immune response in a patient uh, through the use of liposomal nanoparticles. And in 2013, Science Magazine named uh, cancer immunotherapy as breakthrough of the year. And now the question is, why isn't immunotherapy as widely used as we'd think it would be? That's because of immunosuppression. And immunosuppression is when a tumor grows, it evolves the ability to suppress the immune response. So our lab's goal is to uh, counteract this immunosuppression. Uh, my personal research is through the use of this molecule called CPG. When CPG enters the body, it's recognized as a bacterial infection, and it bolsters the immune response. In order to make this more effective, we're encapsulating the CPG using liposomal nanoparticles that have a specific immuno, immune cell targeting system that gets to macrophages and dendritic cells specifically because they are the antigen-presenting immune cells. And these are just a few pictures of uh, what we do in lab on a daily basis. We have several lab benches. The, hold on, let me go over here. So this is the nano drop. And that's used to measure if we've successfully encapsulated the CPG. We also run agarose gels to kind of disprove or prove that the nanodrop is accurate. 
These, right here, these are picture, pictures of vials of liposomes. Uh, liposomes are about 100 nanometers in diameter. Uh, they're very, very small. They're about one ten thousandth to the size of a head of a pin. Um, this is our mascot, or I like to call him our mousecot. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then we use flow cytometry to see uh, if the liposomes have actually hit the types of white blood cells that we've hoped it would. So, who's a part of the research? Um, when I asked my mentor to send me a picture of himself, he sent me a selfie of himself, his wife, and his kids. And what's really cool is that uh, Holly, she's a postdoctoral fellow in our lab, she's actually his wife, and she is, her research is in oncology. And I went into this research not knowing much about cancer and the biology of cancer itself, and she gave me a crash course. Um, and then we have four undergraduates, including myself, and then Sho, she's my uh, specific lab partner, and we work on the CPG liposome nanoparticles together. And Garrett and Gabe are actually working with, uh, she's not pictured, but Chris Mann, she's a professor emerita, which means that she is retired from teaching. She's in her late 70s and is still an avid researcher in our lab. And then Alex Francian, she's our PhD student. And together we have a very ongoing mentorship between all of us, and every day in the lab we're learning new things um, and teaching each other about different techniques. Um, Alex has to put up with all the undergraduates not knowing how to properly pipette or dispose of things or uh, use blood uh, correctly because uh, we use uh, our own mentor's blood. <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, we just have to learn all the lab techniques uh, under her. And uh, when we come into, we have uh, lab meetings specifically all together in a conference room on Wednesday mornings and we kind of go over what everybody's doing to make sure that we're all up to date because we all help each other on our own research projects. Um, Max is very relaxed, uh, very, he hates when I call him Dr. Kohlberg, I have to call him Max. He absolutely hates formality. And um, I, I texted him before this and I was like, oh, my, re my, pre my presentation is coming up and he's like, oh, you'll be fine. Um, so that's always nice to know that your mentor has faith in you. And since the four the other scholars did such a great job of presenting uh, how their research goes and how they're mentored, I'm just going to talk about how you when, you, when you pick your mentor, I, you don't always get to pick your mentor, but you have kind of a choice, is pick something that you're actually passionate about and something that you're going to be interested in for several years because you don't want to go into this with the idea that you'll be spending so much time with these people and not really being passionate about what you're going to be involved in. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ashley and everyone. Uh, just as a, as a mini experiment, uh, let's take 30 seconds to let this rich body of experience and story settle in our minds and our hearts and spirits before we enter into the questions. Uh, so I'll keep track of time. Bells will start 30 seconds and bells will bring us back together. We'll never entirely know what difference that made, but the importance, the importance is just wondering what difference did it make and, and experimenting and being playful with how we interact with one another, how we learn, how we process. Uh, so Jen, you'll help me with 
Oh. And Don uh, will help. Uh, so let's see who among us has questions for our panelists. I actually Dawn. have a question. Dawn, you have a question. I have the mic. All right. I'm not here to help. I'm here to ask questions. Um, so I have to tell you, I feel all of you have probably seen me back here, just my grin glowing. It is tremendous to see, um, I don't want to say transformation because I think that's the wrong word. I mean, you're the same people you were a year ago, but it's amazing to see this point in your journey. Yeah. And um, I want to thank you all again for being here. You all said you were nervous and that did not come across at all. I do have a question here. Um, <laughs> here's my question. Um, and I know all of you can't, we don't have time for everyone to answer it, but maybe if a couple of you feel compelled to. We introduced elevator pitches here on Monday and um, we've been talking about it since. And I think some people, many people were thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know about this. And I wondered if you could speak to, if you remember back a year ago, when you first created that elevator pitch and how then you got to the place you are now and maybe just a tiny bit about that transition in between. Okay, so when we did elevator pitches last year, mine was completely different than what it is now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, we actually had an RLC matching session, I think last week or two weeks ago at the most. And my elevator pitch, um, it was interesting just to kind of see how much it had changed from last year. Then also during the matching session, my elevator pitch changed like three times. And I think it's important just to kind of recognize that like your elevator pitch is going to change like differently for who you're talking to. And also like you might say something to one person and be like, whoa, okay, they had a lot of questions and that made no sense. So maybe I'm not being clear. And you kind of learn how to like navigate through it so that you can like get to like a place where like your elevator pitch makes sense. So I feel like I know it's super stressful and I was crazy stressed out, especially like I have a lot of anxiety most of the time of my life. So I feel like just knowing that it's like really fluid and that like it's going to change and just being prepared for it to change. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else speak to? Yeah, come on. Thanks, Kim. Um, so very similar for me. And I just wanted to add uh, Doing the elevator pitch last year was the first time that I had to kind of put into words what I thought my research interests were and that was really scary and turns out that I was wrong, but that's fine. You're uh, kind of through continued research. Uh, I, there's, I've had so much clarity this year in figuring out what I want to do in grad school and then just looking into programs all across the country. Um, so like don't feel too intimidated by the elevator pitch. It's good experience and uh, you know, it's like if you don't have the the background, it's not really fair to assume that you're going to be able to like perfectly put in. Some people will, but uh, perfectly put into words like what you want to do with the rest of your life. But it's a really good way to start thinking about it because that's what you'll be doing for the rest of your uh, undergrad career. So. Okay. All right. Let's see where our questions are. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think everyone here has some idea as to their elevator pitch, right? Um, we, we all went through the process of you know, having some kind of you know, aim as to, I mean, I, I work at the mental hospital in Hawaii and um, I've been there for 10 years and um, I was always interested in um, finding out how when one is treated for their, um, with psychotropic drugs and everything and they were released, um, there's serious things that happens, you know, whether um, they will always end up coming back, you know, um, or serious things would happen out, outside. And um, because of overcrowding and everything, it became um, shorter and shorter, their treatment time in the hospital. So, you know, that was my goal. I mean, I guess my question is um, how long... Um, I don't have anything specific to target as to what I want to research on yet. I just, I, I kind of have that idea. Um, how long did it take you guys to actually pinpoint something specific that you guys wanted to study? Great question. Tell me your name. Uh, Carmen. Carmen. All right, Carmen. Thank you for your question, Carmen. Who'd like to respond to that? Zach, come on. Um, so one of the things that I noticed when I went into my lab is um, my lab deals with or chronic pain um, and my interests lie more along learning. Um, 
but as you become part of your RLC, um, you'll get to talk with other researchers, you'll get to see what they're working on, and a lot of times um, you find an interest that's relatable to uh, someone else in your lab. Um, and the good news is that when you pick a research topic, something to look at, you know, like an elevator pitch, um, while you're working on that, you can also be working on other things, or when you're done with that, you can go work on other things. You know, the research field is a career, not just a one-time study. Um, so as you go, you might pinpoint one thing that you're interested in, and then a month after you finish it, you find another thing um, that is another faucet of the same topic, um, but another way to look at it. So uh, it, it doesn't take a lot of time to find something that relates to you or that you are interested in and want to do. Thank you, Zach. And I would just toss out that I think it's valuable to also just make note and see valuable what you do not want to do. You know, that, that can be a good indicator as well. Some of us might have the uh, experience of somebody saying, you know, what do you want to have for dinner tonight? Oh, I don't care. And then someone says, you know, let's have uh, pork chops. Oh, I don't want pork chops. Well, you, you, you know, clearly you knew what you didn't want. You didn't want pork chops. You know, you wanted spaghetti or, you know, you wanted uh, salad rolls or something. So just to kind of have that in your mind that what I don't want will also help inform my elevator pitch, help, help inform my pursuits. So I think just collecting that information is valuable. Other folks? Uh, my name is Victoria. Uh, with the research, I'm pretty sure you guys had other things to do. And I just wanted to know how y'all just managed everything, because it sounds busy what y'all do in the research, let alone like in life. So, yes, I would like to know that. Excellent question, Victoria. They're not just sitting around doing nothing. Yes, Sean, come on. Um. So when I started, uh, because when you guys start, you're going to be so excited, and you're going to say yes to everything. So, you know, they would, they would ask me to do something, I would just say yes, 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 yes. And then, you know, then I go home, and I'm like, God, I got to study for the exam, and, and I got to do everything um, that I said yes to. So f for me, it was just, um, you know, the person you're working with, they're going to understand that you're in school and working and, 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 and everything that's going on with you. So... Uh, you know, hopefully they're easy to, to reach and you can say, hey, I, I might need a couple extra days for this or, um, you know, I won't be able to come in next week. Can we meet, you know, the following week or switch up the days or something? So they're pretty flexible. Um, you should be flexible. And um, it's hard not to take in too much because um, you're just like, yes, like I can help. I can do whatever you want me to do. Uh, but just kind of realize that you have to have to have a little bit of balance. Um, but they should, they should work with you. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? that? This is a theme that has been raised more than once. Yeah, Kim, come on. And I think it's a valuable one because it's hard to see how it all connects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something that a lot of people talked about in their slideshow too is uh, communication because um, the people in the lab that you'll be working in are really busy and they want you to succeed, but they also forget that you have finals. So uh, it's a matter of weighing, being respectful of their time, so being upfront about what you can and can't do. Um, so just talking about everything and reminding people too, because if you tell someone like, oh, I can't be here next Tuesday, they probably, they might not remember, just you know, staying, staying up on that. So communication, 100%, because every, everybody in the lab wants you to succeed as a student, um, but it might not be the, primary thing that they're thinking about, so, yeah. Okay, other questions? Uh, my name's Omar. Um, it sounds like some of you guys sort of were placed into labs with, like, not a lot of input. How much, I guess, input do you guys feel like you did have in that? Very good question, and a question that uh, I've been asked a couple times already, just informally at... Uh, Maya, come on up. So I just have a follow-up question. When you say input, do you mean kind of like the choice that we had and like what we were doing in our lab, or what do you mean by input? Oh, like getting into the lab? 
Okay, so when we did our elevator pitches last year, a lot of where we were getting placed came from what we said in our elevator pitch. So I think that as like the lab that I'm in now being not really related to my major is due highly in part because I changed my major. So <laughs> after I got placed, I changed my major and it wasn't so much as like the neuroscience part. It was more so of like community health. So now I'm community health, but I think that also within my lab, I was able to kind of take the neuroimaging part and like when I walked in they were like hey like what are your interests what are you working on and I was like hey I'm really interested in like socioeconomic status and like how that affects like people and stuff like that so the lab was really able to kind of take what I like already had and like make it something that they were already doing or like kind of like make my own project so you just kind of have to tell them like what you want to do and it like again might not be 100% but they're gonna try to work with you and make sure that you're doing research that you want to do Yeah, weigh in on that too. So another thing to keep in mind is um, even if you get placed in a research lab that you that doesn't necessarily align with your um, particular interests, um, a big part of uh, research is looking at different ways to solve problems. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you have ever played that game on Wikipedia where you can relate anything to anything else in six degrees. <laughs> Um, but it, it can be a lot like that, where, uh, for instance, with my research, um, it was NICU visitation data, which doesn't directly pertain to chronic pain in adolescents. Um, but because all the researchers work closely together um, and they communicate with each other, and a lot of times your research mentor, if you express that you want to be looking at something else, they can get you in contact with researchers who are doing other things. Um, and you can use that as kind of a springboard to pursue your own research. So. Thank you, Zach. Hi, my name's Nick. Uh, thank you guys for coming out today. And I'm just curious, we're in week one right now, so we, we see the thousand miles to Philadelphia. And we're, when, I was kind of wondering, when did you start that after this week? Was it the next week you were in a lab, three months later you were in a lab? Like, what was kind of the process of you getting there? And what timeline should we be expecting in the next year? Excellent question. Yeah. Ashley, take it away. All right, so I think my fellow scholars started their research much, much sooner than I did. Um, after leaving the one-week orientation last summer, we, uh, when school started in the fall back at UAA, we started having these kind of bi-weekly research presentations from um, some of the faculty at UAA, so we'd get an idea of who we could possibly involve in our RLCs. So I knew who I wanted uh, right off the bat from our first forum. Um, he was actually the first person to present, and I was like, that's the one I want. He's the one I want. And uh, I didn't get in contact with him until February of this year. And then I didn't start actively going to lab until late April. So in the past two months, I've been able to learn and attain all of this knowledge and all of these uh, techniques. And you don't have to go into a lab knowing anything. Uh, and they teach you really quickly. And if they see how passionate you are and excited about the work you are, you'll learn it just as fast as you'd hope you would. So, thank you. Jen, you have anybody back there? Uh. I just want to make a quick comment. We will talk more about RLC. About RLC selection? I have a really loud voice. Um, <laughs> tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, there will be, I think, an hour and a half dedicated to RLC stuff. So um, don't worry about that. If it doesn't, all of your specifics of your question get asked, um, asked today. We will talk about it tomorrow. And if you have more questions after that, um, we'll be happy to go further in depth. Thank you, Marguerite. Yeah. Okay. What else do we have? Yeah. Thank you. Deja Brooks. So I was just wondering, I'm sure it varies, but on average, how many hours do you spend in lab? After the first 25,000, do you keep counting? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so the time I spend per week is about 10 hours. Um, I personally spend a bit more time at home working on things as well, um, just because I have the spare time. And uh, with an OHSU ID badge comes free lynda.com. <laughs> so I'm constantly looking through statistical software and things like that on just for my own personal skills and knowledge. Um, but the expectation is about 10, 10 hours a week. 
For me, it was about 10 hours a week also, but um, during times of like high periods, like when I was um, presenting the poster, I spent a lot of time at home like researching and preparing for the poster and making sure that everything was like very well laid out. And I think I came in on a couple of Fridays just because I really wanted my poster to look good. So it kind of goes on based on how much effort you want to put into it and like making the most out of your experience. So it's summertime for me and that's when I started. So I've done about 15 to 20 hours per week uh, in lab. Uh, because it's very lab-based and it's kind of hard to do any experiments at home and I also work part-time but uh, During the school year, it'll be about 10 hours. So I think across the board. It's it's 10 hours a week is a good estimate Yeah, I would say uh, During the school terms it was about 10 to 15 hours a week and then and now that I'm just doing that in the summer uh, I it, unlimited hours, like as many hours as I want to work, so there's a lot going on, but definitely uh, it's just a matter of how much time you have to have available. Um, but yeah, certainly I would expect 10 hours, and that's really how long anything less than that, and you're not really getting involved in like serious projects, so 10 hours is a good estimate, I would say. Um, yeah, it's just going to depend on the lab that you're working with. Um, you know, I go up to Katie's office for like 30 minutes, but I'll leave with like, you know, 15 hours worth of work to do throughout the week. So, um, you know, it kind of just depends on who you're working with. I think, too, it's worth noting that there's kind of a mysterious math that can occur, that when you're dedicating time, well, uh, for some of us hearing 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week, oh my goodness, where am I going to wiggle that in? Uh, to allow for the possibility that these hours of time will actually augment and bolster, enhance everything else that you're doing. So that's a kind of curious calculus that is part of uh, Exito uh, here. And I think um, uh, current scholars would attest to that, that uh, it's less about the more time and in, in many ways uh, about the just peaked interest, skills, abilities, and facility with your learning. So yeah, thank you. I kind of have like two questions. So one is like um, to add on to the previous questions. Would you consider the workload of doing research like taking another class? And the other question is what um, math or science background, like classes you've taken before doing the research? Um, so it is uh, very similar to taking another class. Um, it's, I would reckon it to um, like one of the more difficult science classes as far as time input. Um, so like a four credit chemistry class you might spend, you know, 10 hours a week on relatively quickly. Um, and then what was your second question? I'm sorry. What math or science background? Gotcha. Um, so uh, she asked what uh, science or math background I had. Um, I have the basic algebra, um, trig, and uh, some intro level chem courses, 100 level. Um, but even if you come in without any background, um, a lot of the things that you'll be doing, uh, you can be brought up to speed on relatively quickly. Um, because even if you don't understand what's going on beneath, uh, you know, with all the principles and everything, um, you will be able to understand how to do the work. So, um, and you can pick up uh, what's going on beneath as you go through your undergrad. Um, I think for me, um, I'm sorry, what was the first question again? Oh, like another course. Um, yes, I would say that it's about like the workload of like another course. And then as far as math and science requirements, I didn't really, t I took math and science, but it was all just at the very basic level. But I think that the most important thing in my lab was just having an understanding of basic statistics, because it kind of like determines whether or not your results are significant and like kind of when you like, if you are working on a paper or you're going to present a poster, kind of like summarizing all of your results as to like, oh, I found this, but is it like, does this really mean anything? So I think stats is like the one class that's like really important math wise. I'm not sure about science, but also I was in more of like a social science lab, so I can't answer that. 
So it is kind of like another course, but you don't have formal homework and you're not graded. So that's a good thing to remember about going into lab. You're not getting like, oh, A for participation. No, it's not like that at all. And then in terms of my math and science, I have taken basic chemistry, organic chemistry, and I'm about to take biochemistry. I've taken all of the calculus courses except for Calc 3, and I've done advanced statistics. Um, but he never asked me about any of that. He didn't care what my background was. He just saw that I was excited about the research, and that's what's really important, in my opinion. Oh, wait, hold on. Um, I just wanted to thank you for presenting, first of all, and I wanted to ask everyone how independent you felt your studies were or how much you were able to actually design your, help design your own research project. Um, yeah. in, the, in the interest of time, let's kind of go down the line maybe in a sentence or two, okay? Um, so mine was very much uh, dependent on the project. I had one project that was completely my own work, um, and then I've had multiple projects where uh, I'm just part of a team that is doing a project, so I'm one of many. Same as Zach, um, the data analysis was a multiple project thing, but the research that I was doing individually was very specific to kind of what I wanted to do. No one else in the lab was doing it. All of my mentors' work is with liposomal nanoparticles. Uh, I got to choose which uh, molecule I got to encapsulate. Um, so I also work in, I work in a biochemistry lab. Um, there are, depending on the sort of research you'll be doing, there might be a lot of skills that you need to develop before you'll just be uh, set off on your own. And so that's sort of my experience where uh, I spent a lot of time learning methods and learning how to use certain machines and uh, you gain independence in each of those activities as you go along. But as far as the whole project goes, I'm not exactly doing my own research as part of a bigger project. Um, and in my lab, everybody's research sounds so interesting. I don't know. <laughs> with me, like me, it's a small team. It's, uh, I work with Katie and this, this other grad student named Allison. And we just kind of sit down and talk. Um, everybody puts in their input. So, if, if I kind of came up with an idea that's a better way to collect data, then, you know, they'll use that. So, um, yeah. First year scholars, if you can, just come into the center here, the center space. I'd like to just end our session here with some words of gratitude for uh, our scholars. What, what, what words of gratitude would we have? Who has a, a phrase or something for which you're, you're grateful as a result of their participation? Tyler, I was a dental assistant for 18 years, and I am so impressed with what you said about fluoride and Oregon, Oregonians and fluoride, and just, wow, thank you. Um, I especially appreciated the fact that like you guys didn't have first year scholars like from the year before to sort of guide you guys so I think it's awesome that you're able to still give us really good feedback and like advice. Yeah. They're, they're blazing the trail. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you to Zach personally because I didn't even know about this program until I met you. And he encouraged me that I am smart enough and I do deserve this, which I didn't think I did. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you. Carol, can we hop over here? Yeah. Where are you? Help me. Yes. Okay, great. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you guys for breaking barriers. Hmm. Excellent. You have anybody else over there? All right, I got one more over here. Hi, my name is Jewel, and I just want to say thanks to everyone who came and shared their experience in their first year, and first year plus, I guess, this summer. Um, and it's really refreshing to know that like, we're all human and not everyone knows their path and like, what they want to do exactly. Um, I know I struggled a lot with deciding what I'm interested in, wanting to dip my toes into everything, so I want to say thanks, and thanks for reminding me that you know, everyone's human, so it's awesome. What a lovely uh, concluding comment, a reminder that we're all human. It's a great place to, to uh, transition us into lunch. So let's offer applause here.